And I just wanted to, to welcome everyone today on this end, nearing the end of spring or nearing the end of winter and hopefully spring very shortly. Um, and I just wanted to recognize that today, most of us are attending from the Kingston area um, situated on the traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territories. And on this late March day, just wanna thank everyone for giving their time to be present here today. Um, listen to our talk and and focus on what gives us meaning in terms of as individuals and society as we listen to, to Ellen presenting. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Ellen McGarrity Shipley, who I've known and her mom for many years, so I should know how to pronounce your last name, Ellen. <laughs> and it's still a tongue twister. Ellen is a physiotherapist and she's a recent PhD graduate from Queen's University, the School of Kinesiology. And her studies have explored social and societal determinants of health. So when we think about building a more equitable society. In her PhD studies, she looked at the impact of shame on human physiology and health, and also spearheaded and co-founded a research project in Kingston to improve the collection and use of social determinants of health information in healthcare. And I know she's been deeply also working on a project on social prescribing, sort of extending that work from a clinical perspective too. So Ellen, we're really excited to hear your, your dissertation work. Thank you. And I'm gonna hand this over and you should be good to go. Okay. So hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for my little, <laughs> little group here too. Um, so yeah, so I'll just jump into it. I haven't done a presentation in a little bit, so we'll see how this goes, but it should be okay. Um, okay. Um, so first I'm going to start by talking a little bit about my career journey um, through physiotherapy, uh, my PhD, uh, and postdoc. And then now into a little bit of a rest period, as I'm going to talk about um, in a little bit. I'm also going to talk about my research. So my PhD, where I looked at the impact of shame on human physiology and health. Um, and then also my postdoc, where I was looking at better incorporating um, the assessment and use of social determinant of health data in healthcare. Um, then some conclusions, and I'm going to try to leave a good amount of time for the Q&A as well. Um, so yeah, so my name is Ellen. I'm a physiotherapist at Kingston General Hospital and Providence Care Hospital right now. So just working uh, part time. Um, in terms of where I came from, so I did an undergrad in kinesiology at Queens, um, had a lot of positive experiences volunteering for physiotherapy programs there. And so this is what led me to uh, start doing a, a physiotherapy degree at Western University. Uh, for reasons I'm going to explain in a little bit, I then came back to do a PhD in kinesiology at Queens, um, and then also right away started a postdoctoral fellowship at Queens too. Um, so um, I'm not sure if anyone here has done an undergrad in kinesiology, but one of the things, one of the mandatory courses you have to take is called social determinants of health, um, and so you know, didn't think about it a ton in undergrad, but did have that in the back of my brain that entire time as I was going through the degree. Um, but when I came to physiotherapy school, um, there are times where we talk about why are people sick? I think to give that context of why do people end up in hospital? Um, and what I found was to my surprise, there was actually essentially little to no discussion of the social determinants of health. Um, they would talk about genes, like genetic factors. They would talk about behaviors that make people sick, but they didn't at all mention about the social determinants of health. Um, and I thought this was strange and a little bit problematic because they are such important determinants of health. Um, there's a lot of different estimates, but people tend to estimate they're just as important, if not even more important than those things we typically think of that make people sick. Um, and so what this does is it creates a very narrow understanding of why people get sick. Um, we think, you know, people get sick because of their genetics, there's something wrong with their body, um, or there's something wrong with the way they're taking care of themselves. And that's kind of it. And so we have this very narrow, shrunk in understanding 
Um, but in reality, you know, we're human beings, we're social species. I think we like to think that we have maybe more control than we actually do over our lives, I think just for our own sort of comfort. Um, but in reality, you know, we don't live in vacuums. We live in societies. And so there are all these factors that are constantly impacting us that we don't necessarily have control over. Um, and it's important that we recognize this and we talk about it. Um, and what I feel like this kind of leads to, this narrow understanding leads to, is kind of this more victim blaming approach in healthcare. Um, this kind of idea that people are sick because they make themselves sick, end of story. Um, you know, you get what's coming to you. You have no one to blame but yourself, these kinds of ideas. And it's not just in healthcare. I don't want to just narrow down healthcare. It's also in society at large. Um, but what happens as a result of this, like the sort of manifestation of this in healthcare is that a lot of the time, like all different settings, all different professionals, there's doesn't discriminate. Like there, I don't want to single anybody out. Um, you just generally hear that when people are educating people not to do certain behaviors um it is sometimes done not always done but sometimes done in a very um sort of shaming uh sort of even i've heard people doing it and more of like a trying to humiliate the patient um into changing their behavior um so smoking is a big one that people i would hear people shamed for um, and, you know, I think it's a hard one because it's like, yes, we want to, you know, educate people to change their behaviors, but at the same time, I think it can be done in a way that's harmful. Um, and so I would be kind of sitting there like seeing people, you know, kind of doing this shaming tactic to patients and actually wonder, does this actually cause harm? Is there a possibility that this causes harm? Um, and I also wondered if it does cause harm, is it possibly contributing to the impaired health that we see in some of these populations, like people who smoke um, and people who are overweight as well? Um, so I had all these thoughts going through my brain, but I'm still like chugging along with physiotherapy school. Um, so after physiotherapy school, I moved to Toronto because I really wanted to live and work there for a bit. Um, I was studying for the licensing exam, um, and one of the big things that happened to me was I really wanted to work at uh, Toronto Rehab Institute in neurological rehab, either in stroke or spinal cord, um, but I actually did not get that job, and it was a bit of a turning point for me because it forced me to reflect on, like, what do I really want? Like, should, do I want to continue to try to do this, or is there something else that might make me feel more fulfilled? Um, so I did a lot of reflecting, uh, and kind of on a whim one day decided to email professors about some of these ideas I was having about shame and social determinants of health. Um, and it turned out that there was a professor at Queens who was really interested in, um, the ideas that I had presented to her and almost right away, um, invited me to come for a PhD. And, um, it was just one of those things that just felt uh, felt right in that moment. It just felt like, yes, this is the thing that I want to do. Um, and while I was waiting to do the PhD, uh, I did work as a physiotherapist at Providence Healthcare, which is a really rewarding and eye-opening experience. Um, so yeah, so then I started the PhD. My main research focus was on um, the impact of shame on cardiovascular function, which I'll talk about that measure in a little bit. Um, and then I also worked as a physiotherapist at the same time uh, at Kingston General Hospital, which is an acute care hospital, and Providence Care, which is an inpatient rehab hospital. Um, but during this time, you know, I was still thinking about social determinants of health. I was kind of satisfying my curiosity for the shame stuff, um, but still thinking about social determinants of health. Um, and I think in a large part because I was still working in healthcare and I was sort of still seeing these patterns happening. Um, and so, uh, during COVID, my research kind of shut down because it's all in-person research. Um, and so I had a bit of time and I started sending out emails to people, um, about these ideas about social determinants of health and are they interested in them too? Um, and it was just a matter of, you know, got a few emails from people, let's meet, talk to this person, talk to this person. Um, eventually got to present my idea to a KHSC executive, a Kingston Health Sciences Center executive, 
um, which encompasses Kingston General Hospital. Um, and she kind of said, this is a great idea. So like, let's do it. And but, you know, it's sort of up to me to try to lead this work. Um, and so I agreed to to try. Um, and I started emailing people trying to gather partners, eventually gathered a lot of great partners on this project, like Rylan Egan, who's a professor here at Queens, and some community organizations who really wanted to make this a reality, um, including Compassionate Communities Kingston, Canada, uh, who is instrumental in this project. Uh, we also got funding from MyTax, uh, CIHR, and Canadian Frailty Network, too. Um, but... <laughs> But I have a joke for you, a PhD COVID teaching two PT jobs and a postdoc walk into a bar. What do you get? Um, the word of like the past couple of years, burnout. Um, you know, and I think this was hard because I do consider myself as someone who enjoys work. I was a kid who actually enjoyed doing homework. Um, and I do, I think also part of it is I take on jobs that I'm passionate about, which helps drive me forward. Um, but I think everyone has their limits. I discovered mine. Um, but it was a hard thing to admit because I think our society really does value that hustle culture that's been called this kind of idea that the harder you work, the more successful you are and the more successful you will be. And I really bought into that idea. But I think that I have to try to find a better balance. Yeah. So in terms of what I'm doing right now, um, I'm trying to rest as much as possible. Um, I'm also, um, I really want to travel because I've never traveled outside of sort of North, Central, South America. So I'm planning a trip to Europe and Africa for September. Um, also giving myself time for other interests like music production and polo. That's horse polo, not water polo. Um, and I'm also working part-time as a physiotherapist. Um, and trying to take some time to reflect on um, where I want to go next. I think I'm really at like a crossroads right now in terms of both my personal life and my professional life. And so want to take some time to reflect on, on the things that I want to do next. And then the plan would be to apply for full-time jobs starting in the fall after I come back from my trip. So to get more into my uh, PhD research, so I did look at the impact of shame on endothelial function, which I will explain, and self-rated health as well. Um, it's always important to define your terms, especially when it comes to emotions, because the definitions are often a little bit messy. Um, so looked at a bunch of research and my comps put together a definition based on all of that, because everyone defines it slightly differently. Um, so shame for, for this research is an unpleasant emotion that happens when you think less of yourself. So it's an emotion that happens when you think things like, I'm a bad person, I'm worthless, I don't deserve love, I'm stupid, like any of those things, shame will, will happen when you're thinking those things. Um, in terms of how it's related to other things, it's thought to be a form of stress. Um, so if you think of stress as like a really general, like, a response to a challenge. Shame would be a response to a social challenge specifically, specifically a challenge to your sense of social value, which is really important to us as human beings, as a social species. Um, it's also important to note that um, we don't like shame people for feeling shame. Um, like shame is unevenly distributed across the population. Some identities are stigmatized more than others. And those people with those identities tend to feel more shame more often um, than people who do not have stigmatized identities. So it's important that we take that sort of societal um, view into consideration. Um, so when shame is increased in a laboratory setting, a very small body of research has found that it increases cortisol, which is a stress hormone, and pro-inflammatory molecules as well. Um, it is also associated with decreased life expectancy among HIV and AIDS patients and decreased self-rated health in college-aged women. But again, very, very small body of research. Um, and of course, no studies had investigated the impacts of shame on indices of, car of cardiovascular disease risk. Um, so in our lab, 
uh, in the lab uh, that Kira has, uh, very interested in this thing called endothelial function. Um, so what that is, is um, it's a single cell layer that lines all of our arter arteries and arterioles. Um, so in this picture, it's all the pink blobs there. The endothelium is interesting because it's vasoprotective. If it's healthy, it actually protects us against atherosclerosis or plaque buildup in our arteries. Um, it also, it doesn't just sit there, it's vasoactive, so it does stuff. It uh, basically, when there's an increase in flow through an artery, um, it causes an artery to expand or dilate. Um, so how this works is when there's an increase in blood flow through the artery, um, this causes a shearing force against the endothelial cells, which causes them to produce vasodilators that diffuse into the smooth muscle cells and relax them. And this causes the artery to dilate. Um, so that's how that works. So the idea is that the greater the dilation that you see in response to a given increase in flow or flow mediated dilation, the more uh, function, the, the higher the function of the endothelium and the more protected that artery is against atherosclerosis. Um, so previous research had found that um, this is negatively impacted by mental stress. So after people are stressed, they don't have as much dilation in their, in their artery in response to an increase in flow. And so because of that and because of shame's sort of relationship with stress, we thought maybe it's impacted by shame as well. Um, so just to give you a, an overview of all the different topics in my thesis. So if we want to study the impact of shame on human physiology, we need a way to increase shame. Um, so some of my research focused on um, a whether or not a written shame induction protocol, which I'll talk about later, was effective at increasing shame. Um, and then we also looked at more of a contextualized shame protocol, um, which involved um, which involved getting women to consume a high fat and sugar beverage um, who are more uh, prone to feeling food related shame. And then we looked at the impact of both of these protocols on endothelial function. Um, and we also looked at um, we also looked at whether chronic shame, people with higher amounts of chronic shame have a decreased self-rated health. So for study one, so essentially we had, two, we had a choice of two different shame protocols. We were like, which one should we use? Um, one way that shame has been increased before in previous research is to get people to write for 15 to 20 minutes about the most shameful experiences of their lives. Um, so that's how we do it. I always have people asking me, how did you increase shame? <laughs> this was the main way that we did it. Um, and so previous research has found this increases shame and pro-inflammatory molecules. Um, but the disadvantage of this is it doesn't have a social evaluation component, um, which previous researchers have said that that is really important at increasing shame and all of its potential physiological correlates. Um, so we wanted to add a social evaluation component to this protocol, um, but we didn't know what would happen because no one had researched this before. So we just wanted to see um, what happens to the effectiveness of this protocol when you add this sort of social evaluative threat element to it, like someone watching you writing, um, someone reading what you wrote and kind of judging you on it. Um, and so this was the purpose to see what happens when we add the social evaluative threat component. Um, and so we found actually no difference in the effectiveness of the two shame protocols. So we had three protocols, the control protocol, uh, where people just wrote about their past 24 hours as objectively as possible. Um, the shame protocol with social evaluative threat, where people will were told the responses would be read by somebody. Um, and then a shame protocol, which was the same thing, but people were told the responses would be immediately shredded and no one would read them. Um, so on the y-axis there is shame and it's just measured with like a previously validated shame scale. And then the bars are pre and post protocol. 
Um, so for the control protocol, um, there was no change in shame. Um, and then for the two shame protocols, shame did increase, um, but it was the same over both protocols. There was no difference in the amount of shame created. Um, so we did choose to use the social evaluative threat one just because it's more theoretically in line with what other researchers have said. Um, and then for our second study, so then we actually used that protocol and looked at does it impact endothelial function? Um, just briefly, the rationale for this was some researchers found increased shame causes increase in cortisol and TNF alpha. Um, and then separate research has found those things negatively impact endothelial function. Um, so the thought was it's possible that increased shame may cause decreases in endothelial function. Um, so we recruited 15 young, healthy men and women. Uh, we measured shame, cortisol, TNF alpha activity, and our measure of endothelial function, which is flow mediated dilation. Um, we then had people complete either a sh the shame protocol um, or the control protocol. So again, the shame protocol, people writing for 20 minutes about the most, ex most shameful experiences of their lives. Um, and everyone did complete both protocols just on different days. So it was a crossover study. And then we measured all of the same things um, after the protocols. And so what we found was shame increased in the shame condition, but not the control, which is what we were hoping to see. We actually did not see any changes in cortisol and TNF alpha activity, which we were not expecting to see. Um, but we did get a almost a significant result with blood pressure such that it increased in response to the shame protocol, but then went even down a little bit in the control. And so this suggests there might have been more sympathetic nervous system activation in the shame protocol compared to the control. So that might be sort of a mechanistic um, a mechanism there. So on to our endothelial function results, which again is measured with flow mediated dilation. Again, higher amount of dilation means better function. Um, so we found that in the shame protocol on the left-hand side, um, that flow mediated dilation actually went down after the shame protocol, um, but it did not change in the control protocol, um, which was, it was like a simple result, but it was really interesting because no one had ever looked at this before. Um, and yeah, kind of opens up questions about why time course, this needs to be repeated, all of that. And then for the third study, this study pretty much came about because of COVID. Um, since our research is all in-person research, I got completely shut down for a good amount of time. Um, and so I decided to do a study where I looked at, do people with higher amounts of chronic shame have decreased self-rated health? Um, so this was an online study. It was just like an online survey study uh, done with uh, Prolific and Qualtrics. Um, and it was a cross-sectional study as well. Um, so we found that shame was associated with three self-rated health variables. Um, and this was independent of typical health risk factors like age, ethnicity, gender, health behaviors, um, health conditions, socioeconomic factors. Um, so we found that increased shame was associated with decreased self-rated health. And again, this is all chronic. So these are people with sort of higher, like baseline levels of shame. Um, increased shame was associated with increased physically unhealthy days per month and increased mentally unhealthy days per month as well. And then finally, study four, looking at the impact of a more real world shame experience. Um, so the rationale for this study, um, there's been a lot of research that's looked at the impact of high sugar and high fat beverages on endothelial function, and they have a negative impact generally. Some research has found no impact, but generally negative impact. Um, but what this research doesn't take into consideration is that there's very much a social context that surrounds high sugar and high fat consumption in our society. Um, and it's generally seen as less acceptable for women compared to men. Um, and so women might be especially susceptible to feeling shame about consuming high amounts of fat and sugar. Um, but no one's investigated whether part of the reason why high fat and sugar beverages impact 
um, endothelial function is because they might cause some food related shame. And so this was our purpose was to explore this question. Um, so if you give somebody a beverage and you present it as unhealthy, will this potentially cause increased amounts of food related shame and more of a reduction of endothelial function as a result compared to if you give someone the exact same beverage, but you present it as healthy, will this potentially cause less of an increase in food related shame or potentially no increase in food related shame and less of an impact on endothelial function as a result? Um, so how we looked at this was we recruited 25 young, healthy women, and we specifically selected women who have very negative perceptions um, and emotions surrounding high sugar and fat consumption. Um, before the protocol, we measured shame, cortisol, uh, glucose, triglycerides, and insulin in blood. Um, and then we also had our measure of endothelial function, flow mediated dilation. So there were three different protocols. Again, this is a crossover study. So everyone completed all the protocols just on different experimental days. Um, one of the protocols was water. They were given water. They were told it was water. There was no trick there. Um, but in the other two conditions, the milkshake condition and the sham NutriShake, these were the exact same beverages. And that's important to note. They were the exact same beverages. But in the milkshake condition, they were given really unhealthy nutrition information about the shake. So really high fat, calorie, sugar. And this was actually accurate to what was actually in the shake. But in the sham NutriShake condition, they were told it was really healthy. So it was really low in fat, sugar, and calories. But it was, it was not in actuality. And so after the protocol, we looked at all the same things we did at baseline, except we also looked at the perception of healthiness and harmfulness. So to our surprise, um, we actually were not successful in manipulating shame. So shame did not increase in response to any of the protocols and neither did cortisol either. Um, the milkshake was perceived to be the least healthy and the most harmful. So we were successful at manipulating perception um, so on this graph, um, per perceived healthiness on the y-axis, the milkshake is the black bar to the far left, then the sham NutriShake is the light gray, and then the control is the dark gray. Um, so you can see the milkshake is perceived to be the least healthy, then the sham NutriShake, and then the control is seen as the most healthy. And then the exact opposite was seen for perceived harmfulness. So milkshake was seen as the most harmful. Um, sham NutriShake in the middle, and then control uh, was the least harmful, again, water. And so what we found for our blood analysis was that triglycerides and insulin increased in both of the milkshake and sham NutriShake conditions. Um, but we did find something interesting with glucose. So it did increase significantly in both of the milkshake and the sham NutriShake conditions. But um, it did increase a little bit more in the milkshake condition compared to the sham NutriShake uh, condition. So there's potentially something going on there. Um, and then for our FMD results, so again, um, higher number equals better function there. Um, it decreased in response to the milkshake condition, but it actually did not change in response to the sham NutriShake condition or the control. Which again is very surprising because the milkshake condition and the sham nutrient conditions are the exact same beverage. The only difference is the perception of harm and perception of healthiness um, and potentially glucose as well. We're getting a slightly higher increase in glucose in the milkshake condition. And so just as an overall summary of all the key results using that same map as before. Um, so our written shame induction protocol was a good way to increase shame. Um, and we did find that increased shame in a laboratory setting does decrease endothelial function. Um, we found that people with higher amounts of chronic shame have decreased self-rated health. Um, and we did not find that our high sugar and fat consumption protocol was successful at increasing shame, is not successful. Um, 
maybe potentially needs to be modified if it was to be successful. And if anyone's interested in that, we can talk about that question and answer. Um, but we were successful at changing perceived healthiness and perceived harmfulness. So the beverage that was perceived to be the least healthy, most harmful, um, decreased endothelial function. And so the take home conclusions of this research is shame negatively impacts um, cardiovascular function um, and self rated health as well. And so this suggests, obviously, there's a lot more research that needs to be done in this area, very preliminary findings. Um, but this suggests that the way we experience things, if we feel more ashamed about doing something or we perceive something to be harmful, it actually might have, it might exaggerate its impact on our physiology in a negative way. Um, and so this research needs to be repeated. This research needs to be um, expanded more. It's a whole area of research in itself um, and also looked at in tandem with cardiovascular disease risk on more of a larger epidemiological scale. Um, but overall, I would say this supports a more empathetic approach to healthcare. I think I think we are definitely moving towards more empathetic healthcare, but kind of just helps to further support uh, the importance of that. Um, not just from a mental health perspective, but also a physical health perspective as well. Um, and that eliciting shame and negative perceptions may actually enhance the harmfulness of the things we're trying to protect people from. Um, another interesting thought as well is confounding. Um, so it just happens to be, and I'm not there, I mean, I could talk about this forever, but it just happens to be that a lot of health determinants are stigmatized. Um, like if you think about ethnicity, body weight, smoking, and the list kind of goes on there. Um, and so these populations tend to experience shame more often. So there's this sort of like, there's a tie, like if we're looking at body weight um, and health outcomes, there's there's an association there between shame and body weight. Um, but the thing is, if we continue to find that shame is negatively associated with health outcomes, it's worth seeing how much of that relationship between body weight and poor health, how much of it is from the body weight itself and how much of it is from the shame. So it would be worth, if we continue to find that worth actually separating out those effects. And this is important, I think firstly, just on a philosophical level to improve our understanding of reality. Um, but it's also important to understand, you know, how are we potentially contributing to the harm of these things? And if we still find that body weight is associated with health independently of shame and all those other things, risk factors that we throw into multiple regression analysis, um, how do we educate people about this without causing harm, without causing shame, without causing an enormous amount of fear surrounding these things? Is there a way that we can do that? Um, and so then, uh, some of those things that people typically put into multiple regression analysis analyses as well are social determinants of health. Um, so now we'll get into uh, some of the work I've done with social determinants of health. Um, and this is sort of the official name that we came up with for this project, so Space for Health. Um, so the problem that I first presented um, to people when I was first talking about this is you know, in healthcare, we tend to do a really good job of looking at the physical and medical things that might be contributing to someone's health. Um, but what we don't assess as routinely are social determinants of health. And those things are things like income, employment, education, social support. Um, they are they are assessed through varying degrees in different places, but there's just not really like a routine way um, of assessing them right now. Um, and so then the potential solution that I was presenting to people uh, was, um, can we make this more routine, the collection of this data more routine, and can we make the use of this data more routine as well? So not just collecting it for the sake of collecting it, but actually collecting it for um, to inform patient health care. Um, and the way this is done is through this term of social prescription. Um, where if you if there's a social determinant of health challenge that someone is having, 
um, actually referring them to community and social services to help them with that challenge. Um, so let's say someone's having a hard time making ends meet financially, um, then referring them to, let's say, a free tax clinic or something like that. So someone can go over with them. Are there any benefits you're missing? Are there any you know, income supplements that you're missing? Um, and then part of this project as well was to measure the impact of this on health outcomes. So if we make these things more routine, does it have a positive impact on people's health outcomes? Um, and uh, we got we have a lot of different project resources for this project, so a lot of different funding sources, as I mentioned before. Um, this means that we do have funding for a dedicated project manager for this project and a social prescribing worker um, to help support uh, the social prescribing work that our healthcare partners do. Um, we also have uh, Compassionate Communities Kingston Canada, one of our partners. They're really interested in this idea of community connectors. Um, so training community members um, to provide info to other community members on helpful community resources. Um, and then one of our partners as well as the Canadian Frailty Network, and they've essentially developed this easy to use online database of community services. Um, so it's easy for healthcare professionals to find something uh, relevant to the patient right away. So how this project works is there are three different quality improvement teams um, for each of our healthcare partners. Um, so one of our healthcare partners is the Diabetes Education and Management Center at Hotel Du. Um, so together with them, with researchers and patient partners, we're trying to come up with a social prescribing and research strategy. So how to change practice, but also how to measure the impact that ha that has on patients. Um, then we also have a separate quality improvement team um, with the Stroke Network of Southeastern Ontario, which is based in Kingston General Hospital. And then also with a rural family medicine team um, just outside of the Kingston area. So all these different quality improvement teams, but then what happens is we bring everything together. We bring all the different um, program ideas together um, during advisory board meetings. Um, and to create an overall strategy as well. So it's not just all these like little separate things, but there's they're under an overall strategy. Um, and this is very much a quality improvement project in that it's extremely iterative. Um, it's a matter of coming up with ideas, getting feedback, changing the ideas, getting feedback, changing the ideas. Um, and even when it does get launched, it will still be iterative at, the, at that point. We'll still constantly be collecting data, um, reporting on the data with our healthcare partners uh, and patient partners and thinking like, is there anything that we need to change about this? What's working, what's not working? Um, and then from a research perspective, some of the things that we would measure, um, so outcome measures, how are we affecting patient health and well-being? Um, one of the measures we've talked about is quality of life or other related measures like well-being. Um, and we look at the impact of the program overall on patients and also how meeting a patient's needs uh, impacts their quality of life or other health uh, outcome measures. Um, other measures included in a quality improvement project are process measures. So what exactly are we doing? How are we affecting patient behaviors? And so those would be things like missed appointments, um, other healthcare cost metrics, um, and then measures of the actual workflow. So how many um, how many people were asked social determinant of health questions, how many people were given social prescriptions, um, those sorts of things. Um, and then balance measures as well. So how is the program potentially impacting uh, people in a negative way? Um, so looking at how easy or difficult is it for healthcare providers to access the program supports. Um, and then related to uh, my shame research, um, potentially uh, how empathetic patients perceive healthcare providers to be. Does it actually change their perception of how empathetic the care is? Um, and then also a really important point to make is that um, we do have social supports, you know, here in Ontario, um, but a lot of the time they're not enough for what people need. It's still not adequate for, for some people's needs. And so we need to make sure we document um, 
when our community supports inadequate. A good example of that is housing. Um, the wait list for housing, I think, is years long. Um, so if someone comes to us with a housing issue and we refer them to housing, but they're going to be waiting for two years, we need to make sure that we're documenting those barriers. Um, so overall, to wrap everything up, uh, generally, my research tries to challenge the perception that we mostly get sick because of our genes or behaviors, or at least tries to shift the focus a little bit to encompass a bit more than that. Um, and try to challenge people to think about the systemic changes we can make uh, to improve population health. Um, so for my PhD research on shame, this really encourages a more empathetic approach to healthcare, not only healthcare, but public health campaigns. Um, because historically, public health campaigns haven't always been the best. Um, like there was a, I think I saw a CDC um, smoking advertisement that said like something like "Don't be a butthead" or something, and it's like, I don't know, <laughs> what are we accomplishing with this, guys? Um, and so, likely, we should move away from using stigmatizing and fear tactics and try to think of other ways um, that we can effectively educate um, the public. And then my research on my postdoc research on social determinants of health. So this helps to broaden our understanding of why people get sick and can help to facilitate more empathetic um, patient care. Uh, also creates more of a bridge between healthcare and social care um, so that information from those two industries can be used to inform one another. So if there are um, gaps in social care, we can sort of see what does that cause the healthcare system when there are gaps in social care. Um, and if there are things happening in healthcare, how could that possibly inform um, the funding of more uh, social care so that people's needs are met um, from a health perspective? So that's it for me. Um, thanks everybody for listening. Um, yeah, thank you. I'll take questions. I have questions, but I, mm -hmm. I'm, we're muted, but if we unmute, we're going to get a mass option if you guys, so. Why don't I go up here in order? Yeah, okay. And you can call for questions yeah. from the people online, yeah. or mostly yeah. one of my colleagues and the others are the education science students. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think all of these officers um, who may have questions. And, I have some that they don't maybe need to pick that up. Yeah. yeah. So everybody, I'm just, um, in case you didn't hear Kathleen, I'm, I'll just be moderating here. So if you do have questions, but feel free to either unmute or pop your questions in the chat. I um, mean, Kathleen, I know has questions here, which I will bring this computer over so she can hear. <laughs> yeah, I can just approach maybe. Okay, approach the bench. <laughs> approach the bench, yes. Thank First, you. I just want to yeah. say, Ellen, yeah. thank you. So interesting, not just to think about the four studies, but then taking the thinking right. behind that and thinking about real health intervention. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, I know there's been so much more work um, thinking like upstream and yeah. thinking about social determinants. For and sure. I know yeah. the community health centers have been advocates for many years. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And so like yeah. building on the alliance really and all yeah. that work that's been done mm -hmm. um, deeply community oriented and bringing it into mm -hmm. more acute care, which I think we forget mm -hmm. about yeah. this sort of thinking. It's easy to, to zero in on the uh, physical health issue. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you. Sure. Really important work. Yeah. Um, Thanks. So I don't know if anyone online, no pressure, but just wanted to open it up first for everyone online. Okay. I have a few questions, but Kathleen, if you want to go. Sure. Thank you. I'm a physiotherapist and, uh, and one of my colleagues is on, and we, we're getting better and accreditation standards are holding us to better, but you're right. Historically, PT. Is, yeah, mm -hmm. is, and it's not just physiotherapy no, either. It's, it, it's it's not just physiotherapy. So I think, um, and I'm going to invite you to think about like devil's advocate things that I don't mm -hmm. necessarily believe in, but just if we're going to con con like, convince more yeah. people about this, um, one of the ones was you know whether just like stress has kind of like an inverted view where a certain amount of stress is potentially yeah. good, right? For sure. And I was reflecting on uh, someone, I, I have a great friend of my brother who once uh, said, I convinced myself to stop smoking once I decided I was repulsive. 
And I said, well, congratulations, because none of us could have contributed to that. We like you because we don't think you're repulsive. Mm -hmm. But he succeeded in something because he calibrated a certain amount of shame. Mm -hmm. And when I think about how, you know, I, I, I sort of, I shame myself from going to, to going to the gym, right? Mm -hmm. and, and is it, is it sort of any amount of shame is bad or uncontrollable shame? And I wonder if mm -hmm. maybe some of that contributes to when you couldn't get the effect that you were sort of hoping for in your experimental conditions is people mm -hmm. kind of self-calibrated their shame to not be so high that it was, it was yeah. bad for you. Um, yeah, so in my comps, um, my I had a sociologist actually on mm -hmm. my comprehensive committee and she challenged me to think about that as well. Um, I think that it's like what I've found is that there's different, it kind of depends on the person and the resources that they have at their disposal. So that's social resources, um, and sort of socioeconomic resources as well. And it tends to be those people who have sort of more of that economic and social support system that can respond, that can sort of use shame to change behaviors. Um, but it's it tends to be the people who are sort of not as advantaged in those areas who really suffer um, from these stigmatizing tactics. So if you think about smoking, um, it's very much more concentrated in a lower socioeconomic status bracket than the higher ones. Um, There's sort of that gradient. And potentially one of the reasons for that is because they don't have as much sort of ability to act on these feelings of shame as as do people are more advantaged um so that's part of it i think another part of it too is we just don't know enough like me like all these questions that you have like the research is just not there to to understand all those different nuances so i think it is important to explore those things um yeah i think that I'm not, and I'm not sure, like it, they might find that maybe there is kind of an inverse hue, just like with stress. Um, but you also might find that maybe other emotions are better to manipulate than shame. Like, for example, there's been a lot of talk about, there's always a lot of talk about guilt. There's like shame and then there's guilt. Um, and shame is really like when you feel like you are a bad person, like you are inferior. Mm -hmm as a result of these things that you're doing or as a, as a result of these identities that you have. Um, but then there's guilt, which is not that you yourself are bad, but that the things you're doing are bad and they're separate from you. And so the idea is that like, there are some researchers who are very strong about this, this like shame is a, is a very antisocial emotion. It's not a good, like we should not be using it at all. Um, and guilt is a pro-social emotion. And guilt is really what we should be um, using to change people's behaviors rather than shame. Because shame, if someone tells you that you yourself are defective, that's a lot harder to change who you are compared to what you do. Yeah. 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 This, I'm just going to pick that up because, I mean, in some ways it would have been, and I'm just curious, so you had a shame scale. It would be interesting also to see a guilt scale. scale yeah. To see, like, are people able to interpret the differences in and yeah. seeing how guilt would have might have impacted. Has mm -hmm. there been research on guilt and the outcomes you're looking at? Yeah, so I <clears throat> I did measure guilt. Um, I did measure guilt in my, I think the first two studies. So the one where I looked at the written shame protocol and its effectiveness, and then the um, endothelial function protocol too. The tricky thing with that is I didn't. It wasn't a focus. The guilt wasn't a focus. Mm -hmm. So I used a. Um, global adjective checklist for that which basically just means I said like how much guilt are you feeling one to five but the problem with that is well what is guilt and people might have different definitions about what guilt is and like what shame is right. um and so it's hard it's not as reliable as like the shame scale um and so I did find that it did increase in the written shame protocol so people did say they were feeling more guilt after yeah. that yeah. um but in the endothelial function study uh, guilt was not correlated with endothelial function reductions whereas shame shame was 
Um, so, but definitely a lot more ne research would need to be done on that actually using a good guild scale and not just the kind of crappy one that I used because it was a second thought. Well, and I can see that guilt and shame are often talked about as like, like as the same thing. Like, People use yeah, them interchangeably. Interchangeably yeah. or the flip side of like you're saying individual versus sort of more general. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and, for sure. and if, if I can add a monitor chat, at least just about time, I'm going to jump yeah. in. Is, and and uh, only uh, one of the, the three who are from our Ethiopian Mass Prayer Foundation community is still online. I won't, I won't call you out because the other two might have also added to it. Is stigma, which is when society says, yes, exactly. or when you know you did something evil, which is why you have yeah. a disability. Yeah. Um, it's something that we encounter. Yeah. Versus, and, and you may not, you may have internalized that, or you may have tried yep. to rebel against it. Yeah. Versus one that is completely, or maybe not completely, but you 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 have internalized yep. the the societal pressure to be slimmer, yes, not smoked or whatever. Yeah. Um, so still, yeah, I'm not I'm thinking stigma to shame. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the stigma thing is interesting because, you know, in my talk, just to simplify it, it tends to be that people were stigmatized on a population level tend to have higher amounts of shame. But it is true that there is this individual resilience. Not everyone internalizes that. Yeah. I mean, most likely everyone experiences some form of discrimination, yes. like acts of discrimination, but not everybody internalizes that and says like, I'm a bad person. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the shame thing is interesting because it's a barometer of how much someone's internalized that. Mm -hmm. um, so if you did do sort of that study um, that I was talking about with body weight, you could compare people who have a high body weight, but low shame to people who have a high body weight and really high shame. And that kind of gives you an idea of how much someone compare people who have not internalized it to people who have internalized it. I mean, it kind of gives you an idea of if body weight was not stigmatized in our society, what would its relationship be with health? Yeah. Well, and I think you touched on it and I'm just monitoring the chat too. You know, when we think about behavioral changes and, mm -hmm. you know, I, you know, working with older adults and individuals with chronic conditions, like there is lots of pushback in the whole self-management field, chronic condition management mm -hmm. about some of those terminologies. Yeah. And so like, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. You mean pushback in terms of... Just like you kind of alluded to like by making someone change behavior or like sort of making it seem like they, they're making bad choices. Yeah. Like how, what are your suggestions in terms of approaching... Person. yeah I know it is hard lots of con like conversation yeah in the literature about that yeah and it's all that thing about is it is it worth it mm -hmm. like do the pros of getting people to change behaviors outweigh the cons mm -hmm. of of you know shaming and mm -hmm. and fear but I think that yeah I mean my response to that would be but we don't have a good understanding of what shame and fear do to people. Like we, we don't fully understand the, so we can't make a fully informed decision about whether or not it's worth it. Um, and maybe to do it's that. changing as I was thinking, I was like, maybe it's reframing too, right? So yeah. like saying that when you're having the milkshake, yeah. rather than saying I'm feeling guilty, be like, you know what, I'm really going to enjoy this for right now. Yeah. And I'm mm -hmm. just thinking like there's a whole now, like it's called lifestyle medicine. Like yeah. to me, that's the positive side of behavioral change. Like I think mm -hmm. it's so negative, but like making it about lifestyle habits versus mm -hmm. like you have to- Yeah, this is always changes. bad. This yeah. thing is always bad. But yeah. Sort of like reframing your mind. That would be interesting mm -hmm. to see how, if you had people with a milkshake, like giving them like self positive self-talk. Mm -hmm. yeah. All I knew was I should drink more water. <laughs> <laughs> Um, right, Ellen, I just want to say thank you. Yeah, um, someone just put in a quote. So the, uh, yeah, Thanks, Trisha. Yes, yes it's, it's we're three minutes too. So yeah, thank you very much, Trisha. And, and thank you for connecting um, Ellen and uh, have, having her, inviting her here. Um, and I know we're sort of two minutes, three minutes before, but thanks again, Ellen. Yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah. And this is recorded, so we will edit this and actually post it. Oh, sounds good. Okay, yeah. And we'll send that to you. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Sherry. Thanks, everybody.